things to do. Anybody ever hear the phrase, time flies? I don't know exactly what that means. What does time flies mean to you? Anybody? What does that mean? Does it? Now, sometimes it seems like time flies, and sometimes it seems like time drags. Have you ever had been one of those, you know? Uh, and yet time is constant. Is that right? It's constant. It is just always constant. And so the, the question of whether or not it's flying or whether it's dragging is whether or not I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And so it's not that time flies or that time drags. I fly and drag. How many of you ever just get up happy, ready to go? Here we go, boom. How many of us, I don't even want to, even though I want to do what I'm going to do, I don't want to do it yet. I'm not ready to do it yet. And yet, how many of us, when we really, really, really want to do it, we'll get to it right away. And sometimes, you know, we procrastinate. We have still got projects in boxes that we were going to do, and they're in the box from when we moved from Georgia. But for one day, we are going to do it. Nehemiah starts to make his way back. I want you to notice something. In, in chapter 2, verse number 8, it says, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. And in verse number 9, it goes from the end of verse number 8, to, and then I came to the governors. In just one verse, in just one verse, Nehemiah makes his way all the way back from Babylon all the way back to Jerusalem in one verse. Now, sometimes in the Bible, it doesn't fill in all the gaps. But we need to remember that there might be a time gap in between verse number 8 and verse number 9 because there wasn't just quantum physics concept going on. That means when you cease to exist in Baghdad and immediately and instantaneously you exist over there in Jerusalem. There had to be something. Now he knew in advance as he was praying what he needed. He needed letters to the governor. He needed letters to Asaph, the keeper of the forest. And he wanted to make sure that when he got there, he had a plan of what to do once he got there. Have you ever showed up for a work day at church and you got there and you showed up and nobody knew what was going to happen that day? I think some of the most frustrating times church people will ever have is when we finally get a whole crowd, group of people, crowd of people to get there and everybody shows up and there's no plan as to what we're going to do. And uh, 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 they call paint the outside of the building. What color paint do we have? Well, the only color we've got is chartreuse. <laughs> All right, well, I got a paintbrush. I got the time. We're here. Let's paint it. Don't have enough paint. But, uh, so we've got to have plans. And it almost sounds like immediately, as soon as the king had granted him his request, immediately Nehemiah got on the project. How many of us have ever heard of the great Hebrew historian by the name of Josephus? Anybody hear me here? Now, I don't recommend you read it like you read the Bible, but it is a wonderful way to get the gaps filled. Because he was keeping track of what was going on. And if we read Antiquities, number 11, if we go to 1.68, verse 0.7, that's a lot of reading. It says this, that it was in the 25th year of King Artaxerxes that Nehemiah started his way back. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. Anybody say, whoa, time out here. If we go back to chapter 1, verse number 2, it was the 20th year in, in the month of Kislev, that he heard about the problem back there. And if we go to chapter 2, verse number 1, it says it was in the month of Nisan, the very first month of the next year, which would have been the 21st year of Artaxerxes. And Josephus says he doesn't even start to go back until the 25th year of King Artaxerxes. That tells me that after the king said you can go, it still took him four years to start. It sounds like it was just overnight. But he immediately started making plans. You know what catches us by surprise is when we know we've got to do something, and we know we've got to do something, and we don't make any plans, and then the day wakes up when you say, well, I wish I would have. Some of the saddest words I ever hear is, I wish I would have. Somebody's going to say one day, I wish I would have thought to ask the church to pray for our nation. Somebody's got to pray for it in advance. I wish I would have gone to the doctor. If 
find out what's wrong with you. I wish I would have. How many of us have ever said that phrase? If I would have only known then what I know now. But how many of us are immediately making all the preparations? Or are we just saying, well, you know, I can't do it now. We are so good at seeing all the landmines and becoming uh, phobiaized in where we are. That we won't do anything. And so it took him four years before the plan actually started. Now, Ezra had a route when he went back some uh, uh, 12 years prior to that. And he, remember, Ezra was a priest. He was not a politician. He was a priest. And so he didn't have an entourage of, of soldiers with him. And so he went the route that would have been the least resistant, but the longest to take. It's not that much longer as far as miles go, but it's miles longer as far as time goes. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of us know how we get from point A to point B? And it's not how many miles, but maybe how many miles per hour you can go on the road? How many of us would rather jump on the highway and get there in a couple of minutes? Even though it might be 10 more miles, it's faster than taking all the surface roads with all the stoplights. And, and when Nehemiah goes back, he goes straight through the heart of the desert. Now take a look at the routes. Here they are. The northern route is called the Hamath route, and that's the route the desert takes. The southern route is called the Tamar route. Now, the only reason they have the names is because there was a city right here by the name of uh, Hamath, and there was a city right here by the name of Tamar. How many of you have ever seen the road that says, oh, you know, that's the road to, to Springtown? And we call that the Springtown road. How many of us know that many times when there were two big cities and there was a road in the middle, they used to call that Midway Road? Or halfway road. Anybody, that's why they named it that. That's how those names started coming into effect. And, and there are these roads. Maybe you might even have heard of a road called like Katrina Road. I'm going to guess maybe at the end of that road, there's a <coughs> Katrina Cantina or something. I, I don't know what's going on. But I want you to notice that the route starting way over here, you can just see the B-A-B-Y. So that's we're going to start in Baby. And we're going to end over here in Jerusalem. Selam, which means what? Peace. Peace. I wish I could have said I cut it off like that on purpose, but I didn't. It just happened that way. Okay. You can see that the routes are not that much longer, except taking a look at the terrain. So as we go around, it would have been all the mushy, rainy spots where Ezra would have been, which means the, they would have been bogged down in the mud. Uh, and it could have taken almost a year between the difference of the two routes. The route that Nehemiah takes only took two months. It was not only so much shorter, it was so much more direct. And it was firmer, flatter roads. But where do you think most of the highway robbers and everybody would be? It bogged down in the mush or right there in the middle of where they could have just easily get in and get out and rob people on the road. It was sort of like being at the corner of 152 and 165, which is what I understand one of the most traffic, drug traffic uh, highway uh, crossroads in all the state of California. We were told that by the chief of police here in town. I got to believe it. Because the chief of police was lying to us. What made the difference? What really made the difference? Remember, he says, if I go back, I need, he says, what do you need? He said, I need letters. So as he goes back, uh, he not only had letters to give the governors, but he hasn't even gotten to the area yet. He also said, and then as they were going, begin reading with me in verse number 8. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. Now, how many of us beyond the river, the, the word beyond and river is both capitalized? In Hebrew, they're both capitalized. And so when it says, when I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, that means the city of Jerusalem. It's just another one of those names for the city of Jerusalem. When I got to the place beyond the river and gave the king's letters, now, the king had sent with me officers of the army and the cavalry. Now, do you think he felt a little bit more secure knowing that he had the cavalry from Babylon riding with him? Do you think now going the direct route, right where all of the robbers were going to be, do you think maybe he said, I can afford to do that? And so he did. And so he went straight across. Now, let's take a look at the difference then of the routes and the people of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, this will start to make sense near the end of the sermon. But I hope at least you can understand what's going on. Ezra was a private citizen. Nehemiah was a member of the royal court. Ezra would have to have petitioned uh, and, and 
in many people's minds, they think, in order for him to go to Artaxerxes and says, please give us protection, it would have given the, uh, the appearance that God was not good enough and strong enough to protect them. Now, Nehemiah wasn't even given the choice. He was just given the sign of trust. Here, I trust you to go back. I want you to go back, and I'm going to protect you to go back. So one was, should I do this, or is that just a sign that maybe I don't have enough trust? Did anybody ever have that problem in our world today? And some people would say, oh, well, I, there's no choice. I'm just going to be protected. I don't even have a choice. The government's going to do it whether I want them to or not. And then we have this dynamic tension between do I trust God or do I trust government? The answer could be, wouldn't it be great if you could trust both? He was authorized to rebuild the Jewish temple and the Jewish law. Ezra. Nehemiah was authorized to go be governor in the entire area. So you see, one was absolutely spiritual. The other one was absolutely spiritual, but he had a political agenda as well. What would happen if our political agendas was absolutely spiritual? It is not by chance that you ask that prayer request today. And we didn't even talk about this yesterday, did we? I mean, I didn't set you up in any way to do that. Only God's Spirit can do that. What would happen if the geopolitical was absolutely theological in Yahweh? It was before and it can be again. The root of Jesse does not. One verse later, if we go from verse number 8 to verse <coughs> number 9, all of a sudden we're getting going to the governors of the area beyond the river. And, and one of them, it comes right into mind in verse number 10, but when Sanballat the Horonite. Now, uh, the word Sanballat literally means this, sun the moon god. That word San is the word Saun. Saun the moon god gives life. So what does the name Sanballat mean? That means the moon god gives life. Now let's not forget, there is a religion that worships the moon god. And there will be a crescent moon on every single one of their flags. Now this does not mean that they were absolutely Muslim in belief. But they already had removed Yahweh, the god of creator of the universe, and started worshiping the creation. And so they were already worshiping the moon. But before we get too excited about that, almost every country back then had ge geographical gods as well as geographical star gods. And so soon, or sin, the moon god gives life. Now it says here that he was from Horono. Horonite. Now that means night means from. Uh, many people believe that maybe, they don't know exactly where this place was, but maybe it was from Huron. Uh, which would have been southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Some people have to believe that it comes from Horon Aene, from Moab. Other people believe it's from Upper and Lower Beth Horon. Now, let's look at it on the map. Remember, he is coming from over here in uh, Babylon. He's going to make his way all the way up. He's going to come down this road eventually. Both Ezra and Nehemiah both come down this road. And normally, you would go ahead to the south side and come up this way. Or you would make your way all the way back over to the Jordan River. Because those were the only two places where the road is really not so, uh, uh, not so on such a steep angle that you could actually get your entourage on up there. So did you go in and out of Jerusalem in both directions? Southwest and northeast when you were going in and out? It's the only two places, really, where the road is, is navigable. Everything else is almost your drop-off. And so if you were going to say, which one of those places might this person, San Ballot, be from, the first one is way up there. The second one is way down there. But the third one, upper and lower, Beth, is right there, 12 miles. And notice where it is. It's right on the intersection of where you either go immediately due east and come in the northern or go due south and come around and go into the other side of Jerusalem. Now, which one would you present yourself if you were going to say, I'm going to hold on to that city and prevent it from doing it? <coughs> I can't believe it was option number three, upper and lower death wrong, but many people do. And if I was going to be a person who was geopolitical and I wanted to make sure that I had a firm grip on something, I would put myself in the position where they had to go through me to get in or go through me to get out. Sam.
can bail it. If we take a look of a thing called the Elephantine Papyrus. Now, when's the last time you read a couple of pages out of there? <laughs> Let me just be honest. How many of you have never heard of this document? Okay. Uh, you know, sometimes you've got to be, uh, you know, sort of like a Hebrew nerd to get some of this stuff. And so, uh, if we take a look at Crowley 30 and the Books of Antiquities, page 492, we discovered that there was a document that was written in 407 B.C. Now, he goes back in 445 B.C. So this document would have been written somewhere around 407 to 445 would be 32 years, 39 years, somewhere in there. Uh, and it's letters to a person by the name of Gogoas. Now, this is the person who becomes governor of Jerusalem after Nehemiah. So letters are written to the governor of Jerusalem, and this is it is written from Paha of Samaria. Now this word Paha literally means governor. So it's written from one governor to another governor. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when there's a football game, the governor of this city will make a bet with the governor or the mayor of that city? You know how those kind of things go? And they'll make treaties back and forth. And so they'll say, all right, we're going to send a letter from the governor of this place to the governor of that place, city or mayor. Uh, back then, a city mayor, or today's city mayor, would be like a city governor back then. And so, guess what the name of the person in the letter is? Sanballat. And so we can go to the Bible and find Sanballat. We can go to other extreme uh, documents that were not written to prove the Bible to be true. And guess what they absolutely do? Prove the Bible to be true. At the exact same time period, the Bible says that it's going. And so it was written to, from Sam Ballot, and he mentions his two sons. Now, his two sons' names is Eleah and Shalemaiah. Aren't those two great names? Now, let's not forget that Sam Ballot's name is after the god of the moon, but he names both of his kids after Yahweh, because the first one means Yahweh, the god of Israel, has raised, and Yahweh, the god of Israel, is my protection, he is my benefactor, he is my all. Now, why would someone who is worshiping the moon god, knocking down the people of God, name his kids biblical names? Because I'm going to say this over and over again. Just because you have a biblical name doesn't make you a Christian. But right away we assume that if somebody attaches a name, that there is an attachment to God. Nothing to be further from the truth. He might have said, oh, I like that name. Margaret taught in a school in Fort Worth. And although she didn't have these two students, there were twins in the, in the school. One was named Orangelo and one was named Ramangelo. And when they asked, wow, those are such cool names, where did they come from? One was from orange jello and one was from lemon jello. <laughs> Orangelo and Lamangelo. And that's the truth. Now we can we can say all kinds of stuff, but why would he name his children? Here, here's a, a travesty. There's a lot of people that think if your lineage were believers, that you're automatic a believer too. And if you pass on a biblical name, God's got to have a special dispensation on you and them, even though you yourself may not even be a believer. In 1962, the Bedouin priests, now how many of us have ever heard of them? They're the ones that found the Dead Sea Scrolls. As they were going through a cave, they went to the Wadi and the Leia, that northwest of where the ruins of Jericho was, and they found a cave. There's all kinds of caves over in that area. Inside the cave, they found a papyri written in the 4th century B.C. Now, the 4th century B.C. would be what? The time of Nehemiah? And so in the 4th century B.C., uh, and shortly thereafter, all the way down to about 400, maybe down to about 390 to 380, and inside there were 200 bodies. And a lot of writings. And one of them were, were written, had written that they had gone into this cave so that they could escape Alexander the Great. Now remember, he dies approximately 323 to 325 B.C. So this is approximately 75 years after the Sanbal and Tobiah situation. But they are still experiencing all kinds of unrest. And so they're trying to escape Alexander the Great. And so one of the writings is signed by the leader of the pack, and the leader of the pack's name was Sanballat, the grandson of the Sanballat. 
We can follow their lineage. Okay? People of war should not be surprised when they are people who get bored. We will study in Sunday school today that God loves peacemakers. And if we're war makers, we should not be surprised if other people make war with us. As they say sometimes, what goes around comes around. It says that there was also with Sambal, there was a guy by the name of Tobiah, many times named Tobias. But Tobiah would be his actual Hebrew name. His name means Yahweh is good. Notice how both of these guys who are ruining God's people both have biblical types of names. It means Yahweh is good. It says that he is an Ammonite. Now, it also says he is an Ammonite servant. Now, we'll talk about that in just one second. There's where Ammon would be. And I want you to notice that if one of the guys was guarding this road, notice where Tobiah could have been. Wouldn't that have been the best place to guard all of those roads from all the people coming in from the north or the south and moving their way over, especially after the Ephraimatic war situations? What do we know about Tobiah? Many people believe that because of his name that he was a Judaizing Ammonite. Now, uh, that may be true. I don't know. If that means that he believed in the God of Yahweh. But if you believed in the God of Yahweh, and even though you were nationally an Ammonite, but you believed in the God of Yahweh, would you destroy the city of God? And so again, just because your name says what? Yahweh is good. Yahweh is great. Does not mean you love Yahweh. Some people believe that he was a Yahwistic Jew. In chapter 6, verse number 18, when we get there a couple of years from now, we discover that he has a son. And the name of his son is that name, Jehohanan. That literally means Yahweh has been gracious. He not only has a Yahweh in his name, he gives Yahweh to his kids' names. Sambal is giving godly names to his kids. Tobiah is giving godly names to his kids. And both of them are knocking down the city of Jerusalem, knocking down the walls, burning down the gates, and preventing Jewish worship. <coughs> Don't be surprised if the biggest obstacle to your faith exists in your faith. And maybe even people within your own faith system. You know, some of the biggest fights is not Christians versus not Christians. It's denominations versus denominations. If we go to be ahead um, and, and we take a look at his writings, we discover this, that it is believed that there was an aristocratic family that lived in the Transjordan who were so prominent that they all of a sudden became 8th century, century leaders in the city of Jerusalem because of who they were, even in the Transjordan, in a place called Amman. And at this particular time, they had palaces in Amman, and they also had palaces in the city of Jerusalem. And they were so prominent that they lived and they, they hung out with people like Uzziah and Hananiah and Hezekiah. Uh, anybody know those names? They were what? The kings of Judah. And he also hobnobbed with Amos and Job, <coughs> Micah, Isaiah. Who were those guys? Those guys were all the prophets of the 8th century. And so a very strong, prominent family. But notice it says here that even though he comes from this strong lineage, that when he gets there, Sambalat was in charge and Tobiah was an Ammonite servant. Now, that word there is Ebed, which usually is translated slave. Now, how many of us can have a powerful political position but still be slave to somebody more powerful? So the word here for slave does not necessarily mean that you are in destitute. It just means that you have somebody so powerful over it, you have got to do whatever they want, even though you have strong political power, strong military power. He was still the slave to Sam Bell. Maybe even like it or not. And it says that he was a slave. It literally means lower in authority. And so he was slaving for him. Again, if we go back to Josephus, what do we discover? That Tobiah was re re related to Elisha. 
And that is the priest of the city of Judah. One of the major priests of the city of Judah. He was related to. Can you see how just because you were related to the priest, the priest could have taught you many things about God. And knowing things about God, you may have liked giving biblical names, godly names to people. But just because you're related to the priest and give out biblical names does not mean you're a believer. You can't get to heaven and all of a sudden say, but Pastor Darrell was my cousin. And what will he say? Paul I know and Jesus I know, but I don't know you. Okay, we find out this, that uh, uh, Tobias' son marries. And who does he marry? All of a sudden, he marries the daughter of Meshulam. And Meshulam is the son of Barakai. And we'll discover that he's the person that Nehemiah puts in charge of rebuilding all the walls. So here it is that your sons and daughters might marry into families of total not believers. Your grandfather could have built this church, and your granddaughter marries outside the church to the very people that antagonized and prevented it from happening. We'll discover all that as we continue. This is a picture. Anybody know what that is? So did you get there? Then I'm on. Did you get there? On? This is a picture called uh, a picture of a temple. And the name of the temple, it was named after Tobiah, and it's called the Temple of the Slave. Because what was Tobiah? He was the slave of the people in higher authority over him. You can still go to there. You can actually see people walking around down below. This is a current picture of that exact same. It says here that they were greatly displeased. When Tobiah heard about it, he passed the word down to San Valley. It says, it displeased them greatly. Now, the word here for displeased means to tremble and be faint-hearted. Anybody ever get so mad that you just can't even talk? You just can't even stop your body from shaking? Uh, it means to tremble violently and then all of a sudden, and just lose heart, lose strength. And the question we have to ask is, these were powerful, powerful men. And why were they trembling? Because someone. Now, you know, how many of you have, and they were greatly troubled, that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel? Anybody got the word someone in there? The word there for someone in the Hebrew is this word, hadam. That means that a second Adam has come. Another hadam has come. So someone has come for the express purpose that he cares for the welfare of God's people. All right, let's start putting all this together. Got Nehemiah for today, number one. Sometimes it takes longer than you think for things to fall into place. But don't wait till the last day. Start now. And the longer you wait to get started, the longer it will take to come to pass. And in fact, it may come to pass so slowly that it incrementally expands the back end. So if we had a project that we wanted to be done in four years, and we wait two years, it could take 12 years for that. Economics can change. Getting back to where God wants you to be may take longer than you think. But don't procrastinate. Today is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad and enjoy the journey. How many of us are so driven about getting from point A to point B that we don't enjoy the journey along the way? All we want to do is get there. And we go past so many great things that God would have wanted to stop and smell the world. Number two, accept God's favor. Uh, what does God's favor mean? God's blessings? Accept God's favor. And I want you to notice this wherever it comes from. In Mark chapter 22, or 12, and in Matthew chapter 22, it says this, Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and to God the things that belong to God. Now, does anybody remember the context? It was over money. Is that right? It was over money. It was all over money. And he says, if it belongs to God, make sure God gets it. But if it belongs to Caesar, why give it to him? But whatever you do, don't give to Caesar what belongs to God. Now, I'm going to say... 
that if it belongs to Caesar, we've got to pay our taxes. That doesn't all of a sudden say, well, 100% of everything I make belongs to God, so I can keep 100% of it. No, we do have to give to Caesar, or we will be punished by Caesar. But let's not give Caesar what belongs to God. When Pastor Darrell says that once you give your tithes and your offerings, the rest of it still belongs to God, the rest of it belongs to God. And after we give to Caesar, the rest of it belongs to God. Remember, Ezra refused to take the welfare or even ask for the welfare of the government. And so he went the long route. But Nehemiah said, I'll take the help from the government. Now I'm going to say this real quickly. Ezra's way was okay. Nehemiah's way was okay. Both ways were okay, as long as you gave to God what belonged to God. And so when somebody comes to me and they say, oh no, I'm not going to keep a record of what I give to the church because I give to God in secret. That's okay, but remember, Caesar's going to give what belongs to God if you did that. I'm not telling you you've got to do it Nehemiah's way. I'm saying if you've heard from pastors in the past that you should tithe off of just what's left over, that's fine. But this is what I believe, that God's blessing sometimes comes from the government. I can remember one time a church gave me a W-2, and they didn't take out any of my uh, uh, mileage. They didn't take out any of my housing. They didn't take out any of my expenses. They gave me a bulk W-2 for every penny that they gave me that year. And then they put it as non-taxable money on top of Margaret's and made us pay $19,000 in taxes. And I called up the IRS, and I said, how? And they said, just ask your church to give you a new W-2. And they wouldn't. Wow, really? Did you know it's okay to claim what you give on your taxes? But if you choose not to, it's okay. But if you choose to claim it and you get $1,000 back, Give the thousand dollars to God then. Otherwise, it just goes to Caesar. But if you choose to do it Ezra's way, it's okay. If you choose to do it Nehemiah's way, it's okay. But if God wants to bless you, take the blessing from wherever He sends it. Because don't be surprised if Art Xerxes gives you all the building materials. Number three: names and lineage. Just because we may have a biblical name does not make us a Christian. And just because we may marry into a, a family that was at one time in charge of building the walls doesn't necessarily mean that we are a Christian. What we discover in the Bible is it only takes one generation to go from a strong believer to not going to church at all. Now you would say, well, what is that? If you said church, what is the difference? Once we stop going to church, what do you think the chances are that we stay a believer? And what do we teach our kids? I don't know how many families I counsel with who say, well, we went to church when we first got married, but then we stopped going to church, and then we had kids, and now we want to go to church, but our kids don't want to. Duh. You're kidding me. Because they didn't see that spiritual side of you. They have no connection to God. Now all of a sudden, you remember your biblical heritage, and you want to bring it up, and all of a sudden, all your kids go, whoa, that's not the family I grew up with. That's not the faith I grew up with. That's not the direction I want to go. And then they can't understand why their 14-year-old is balking at the idea of coming to church. Remember, when we want to get back to God, it's going to take us longer than we think, and it may be even more costly than the original plan. The last one is this one. We live in a post-Christian culture. That's why we need to pray for our country. We live in a post-Christian culture. You know what that means? We don't respect God anymore. And I hate to say this, but even in some churches, we don't expect God. God is just an idea, an abstract idea of good and evil. May the force be with you. We live in a post-Christian culture. And, and Jesus warned us. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good courage. He said, what? I have overcome the world. And so in Christ, I can be a worldly overcomer, but I've got to have a worldview of Christ, not just a worldview of, of, uh, of, of battling and, and rebellion. Some then, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and some now, maybe even governments, would say, we don't want anyone who would care for God's people. 
be in positions of authority. In fact, we don't even want them in positions of authority. We don't even want them in our city. We lived in a place and a church was going to move into the downtown area of the city. And guess what happened? The people who owned businesses in that area went from business to business to business to sign a petition saying, we don't want those kinds of people in our downtown area of our city. They didn't want church. Now hear me. Two of the people that were passing around the petition were very active, strong leaders in another church in that community. But we didn't want those kinds of people. Now the reason I know this is one of our church members actually owned a business right across the street from where the church was going to go in and they came in to solicit them to sign the document. Otherwise, it could have gone on completely unaware. Completely unaware. We don't want people to care about God. We not only don't want the, you know, we don't want this Nehemiah guy to come back with letters from someplace uh, giving him permission to go in and take care of the people of God. We don't want a second Adam. We don't want a someone. We want to eliminate them. Now, do you know what the word for the elimination of the godly is? It's the word secular. So when someone says, what's wrong with secularization? You know what that honestly means? It means eliminate God from every area. And the concept. Anybody ever hear of Francis Chan? Let's read this together. Come on. But God doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust Him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we will be in trouble if He doesn't come through. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for people like Nehemiah who put himself in trouble. For people like Ezra who put himself in harm's way. And maybe even there are people in this very room that might be praying about going into a life of poverty. As a believer, um, it's a no-win situation. Father, if we encourage our best and our brightest out of the world of politics, we are leaving it for the wilds of Satan. And yet at the same time, I also know, Lord, that you can change the hearts of people in powerful positions. Father, I pray that you would sway hearts. And Father, I know that you can make moves even in the hearts of non-believers that causes good things to happen for you and for your children. And so, Lord, I pray today that wherever we may find ourselves, help us to remember it's time to get started, regardless of how long it may take four years to get it really happen. But today is the day. It's time for us to get started. Help us to realize again, Father, that as we get started, uh, we need to stay faithful and obedient and to continue on the way, Father, and allow you to give your graces. And we may be surprised where those graces and blessings may come. And, and we may question whether or not we should participate if it came from a, a quote-unquote, Father, ungodly source. But help us to remember all good and all perfect gifts come down from above. But it could come even from God. But it does come down from above. Help us to remember, Lord, that just because somebody has a connection to a spiritual realm somewhere does not make them spiritual. Help us to pray for our kids and our grandkids that although they may be fully connected to Yahweh today, 